stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, night shift emergency physician, burnout thriver, and wellness champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously. Hello, 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 Fearless Freedom Tribe. Today, we are doing something a little different. Number one, this is a live podcast episode. It is being broadcast on the Facebook page for the podcast as it's happening. And it will then be uploaded to Lipson, which is our our platform, our media platform, uh, tomorrow. So tomorrow at noon, the audio will be available for you to listen to. So just doing things a little bit differently because there has been quite a buzz happening lately. And you literally have to be with your head buried deep in the soil to not know what I'm talking about. And just to kind of give you a little bit of perspective, you know, this has been the quote unquote pink elephant in the room for a long time. This is not a brand new concept. This is not something that just happened overnight. This has been something that has been brewing for decades. And my perspective is slightly different as a individual who originally was born outside of the United States and then made the United States my home. Um, you know, after having some fundamental years in my country, which is Jamaica, and seeing how the system operates there and it being a system that has a history of enslaved Africans working to build up the country, just like the United States has had. Um, There are many, many elements, many moving parts that make the parallel not as much in sync between the two entities, the two places, partially because of the size of the nation that we currently live in, and also the propagation of that mentality of the enslaved um, population and how the country's wealth and stability was built on the backs of millions of African-Americans is different. (laughs) That is different from what we experience in Jamaica. So in Jamaica, we do have prejudice. You know, prejudice exists everywhere. The difference is that the prejudice is not based on your skin color because we have everything there. Where Our motto is out of many one people because we have all of us kind of mixed up. We have... Caucasian, we have, you know, Asian, we have African, but everybody's kind of mixed up. And you're not judged by that, but you are judged by how intelligent you are and you are judged by how much money you have. So there is a classist kind of separation that occurs that is not based on skin color, which is fascinating. So imagine how interesting it was to learn that in this country, that is what we base a lot of things on. And okay, you may be saying that you do not feel this way. You may be saying that you're colorblind. And I respect that. But at the same time, I think, and I can't help but to think that if you truly believe that, that you're ignoring the fact that America doesn't believe that. (laughs) America does not believe that, and it is manifested in overt and implicit ways over and over again on a regular basis. And so what am I talking about? Okay, well, let's just go back to maybe not so long ago, but so I'm a physician, 
And my job as an emergency physician is to care for everyone, regardless of who they are, what they say to me, what they do, et cetera, et cetera, right? It is all comers. I don't have the luxury, if it is a luxury, I'm not quite sure, of choosing who comes to the door or who I treat. Now, that's what I signed up for because that is, that's part of it. And so, you know, I, I am empowered, or I should say, I am, I made a promise to treat everyone no matter what. So I have been called all kinds of names that are not my own name. I have been spat on. I have been peed on. I have had many things happen, but what? I have to put aside my biases and my triggers and decide to do what's right, which is actually provide excellent care to this individual, regardless of how they treat me or what they think of me or how they view me or what they say. Now, that is not true for the rest of society, right? And and even within the fold of my specialty, it is recognized that not every emergency physician feels this way either. And there are times and there are pockets of the population that are treated differently, even in a place where all are to be accepted and all are to be treated equally. Irony, but a reflection of the society as a whole. So what do I mean? Well, I'll tell you that the biggest example is our patients that have an affliction that is basically um majority of the people who have this affliction have melanin in their skin. So maybe their melanin is from the Middle East, you know, and they have a they have a blood disease basically that causes them to have pain when the disease is flaring up by whatever trigger sparks it. And I'm talking about sickle cell, right? So sickle cell is not n- it's not intrinsic only to the United States. We have sickle cell in Jamaica. We have patients who have this problem, right? Because why? Why do we even have sickle cell? sickle cell? Sickle cell basically is there as an adaptation. So we lived in a place, those of African descent lived in a place where malaria was pretty rampant, or still is, I guess, actually. And an adaptation to not having malaria ravage you was to have cells that adapted to that, right? And so as a consequence, you carry the cell that is the adaptive cell. And then unfortunately, you appear with someone who has also that adaptive cell that they're carrying. And then you end up with a one in four chance of having a child that has the disease. Now, the disease is horrible. It is horrible. It is pain and it is pain that you experience all the time at some level. So it's some kind of low grade pain that I can't even imagine, right? I cannot even imagine what a person who has this disease is going through. Just like I cannot imagine what a person who has cystic fibrosis goes through, right? So there are entities that we just cannot relate to. So, but here we have a disease that is afflicted, that has a certain group of people that that, that basically uh, experience it. And they happen to be, like I said, people who have melanin rich skin, right? So now you as a person who is taking care of these individuals, you may have a judgment in your mind that you don't even really realize. And so this is where it gets really crazy. You may think that you are being the best person. You may think that you are treating people fairly. You may think that you are providing the best care, but you may not realize or recognize that, yes, this individual may come in frequently. This individual may require higher pain medications than others. This individual may not demonstrate the same findings, I guess, or expressions on their face. They're not rolling around the bed, ag- you know, in agony. Why? 
because they deal with pain on a regular basis and they take pain medicines at home on a regular basis. So what does that mean? That means that they're going to require more when they come in. They're not drug addicts. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's like, it's like if somebody has diabetes and diabetes affects all people, right? So this is not something that's intrinsic to one particular race or category of people. It's like you have diabetes and you come in and you are, your mental state is not quite altered yet, but you have, you know, your blood sugar is through the roof and you have what we call an anion gap, which means that there is a problem like Houston, there's a problem we need to correct this or bad things are about to happen. You're not going to say, oh, you're not really that bad in your diabetic ketoacidosis. You don't really need to get insulin therapy. You don't really need to get fluids. You don't really need to make sure that we monitor your electrolytes so there's not a devastating outcome. We don't do that, right? And so when people are, you know, basically, I'm, I'm talking about this because I, um, I've had to talk with many colleagues uh, over the last couple of weeks about this and why it's important to not stay silent and why it is significant that, you know, our organizations have come out and made a statement that this situation that happened with this gentleman with the, you know, the cavalier knee on his neck for eight minutes and some seconds that basically cut off the supply of oxygen to his brain and caused the end of his life well before its time because he wasn't even 50 yet. You know, that is just a symbol of the integration or the interwoven nature that is institutional racism. And if you don't realize that or recognize it, then like I said, you probably have your head buried deeply in the sand. And, you know, as a physician and as a house of medicine, the reason why, you know, I, I definitely applaud organizations that came out and made a statement about it and about how egregious it is because it's symbolic of the institutional racism that has happened and that has caused African-Americans and on a whole to get inferior care across the country in multiple modalities, particularly in medicine. And it's a public health issue. Why? Oh, hello. COVID-19 made that very, very clear. COVID-19 essentially exposed the kinks, oh, kinks, the chinks, the chinks in the armor right? It exposed it. it. They were weak points. It basically accentuated every last weak point that is in existence. And it just showed that if you have a population of people, and we're talking millions here, we're not just talking about a few. So 15% of your population is not participating, quote unquote, in the American dream, even though the American dream was facilitated by, by their physical sacrifice, then, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. It makes absolutely no sense. You know, it's, it's just fascinating to me that there is so much imitation of African-American people, so much in everything, in clothing, in swagger, in speech, in media, in music, in everywhere, everything, everything. Everyone wants to be like a Black person, but nobody wants to be a Black person. Or they don't want to be a Black person when it's convenient. So it's just mind-boggling. And so, you know, I'm bringing this back to the public health issue. So you have a situation where for decades, there has been an inequality, right? You know, if you think back to that fence, there's a cartoon that goes around where there's a fence and there are three people, different heights. You have the person who is the appropriate height to see over the fence. Then you have the other two individuals who are nowhere near the height. And the person who is able to see over the, over the fence makes a suggestion that we should all get a crate to stand on. Okay. So everybody gets the same size crate. And lo and behold, 
the, the same size crate just makes that person who's already able to see over the fence able to see even better over the fence, but it does not bring either of the other two individuals who are short on the fence even close to seeing over the fence. So that's not really helping the situation. It's not. It is saying that you cannot have the same formula for every individual that is involved in the scenario if it's not bringing everybody with a view over the fence. It just isn't. And where did it start? Okay, it started way back when, when you were considered property, right? You were considered property. You couldn't have anything of your own. And then finally, when you're freed, quote unquote, you are then allowed to get your own property. But are you really? Do you have the means to do that? Were you ever in a situation where you could thrive on your own? Hmm, something to think about. And then if you were free, didn't have to experience the enslavement per se, you might still have the mentality of enslavement. Why? Because it was something that was passed on from generation to generation. And it was the same thing that allowed for the country to prosper. It just, that's just facts. And so, you know, when there is distrust, when there is discontentment, there is so, there's so much foundation to that. So for example, let's, let's just take something that's a little bit closer than, you know, slavery per se. Just think about what happened to all of those individuals who went and they served in the wars, you know, World War I, World War II. They went and they served in the wars. They, they basically sacrificed themselves. They came back, you know, with uh, limbs sacrificed, et cetera, et cetera. They were promised that they would get the ability to buy a home. They were promised that they'd get the ability to start a new life, GI Bill, et cetera, et cetera. But it was very clear early in the game that this was a contrived promise, right? The promise was, yes, this is what will happen, but you can only live here. We're only going to allow you to live here. And if you are living here and you're prospering and there is any indicator that there could be a integration of your neighborhood, we're going to make it so that when the individuals that are not looking like you come by, we're going to make it look like your neighborhood is so undesirable, they're not going to want to live there. So then there's no integration that happens. And the resources are not for you. So yes, you can live in this home, but you don't get the resources that, that, your, that your compatriots who also fought along with you are going to get in their neighborhoods. And so it starts there, right? So real estate, racism segregating where you can live and where you cannot live. I remember I was growing up in, in New York City and I remember when my mom was going to look for an apartment and literally, this is how crazy it is. One street has black people living on it and the next street is where all of the white people lived. And this is New York City melting pot, supposed to be like the most integrated place. And you, if you as a person with melanin in your skin tried to go and look at that apartment, you were number one, diverted away once they saw your name, if your name had any indication of ethnicity. And two, you went there, they would say, oh, it's already taken. But if you had a white friend who went and looked at the same apartment, they'd be shown, they'd be welcomed in and shown the apartment. So real estate, okay? So we're talking about interwoven into our society. And if you don't see that, I don't know what to say. It's you're, you're walking around with blinders on. That's basically what it is. And so if it's interwoven in real estate, then it's interwoven in the educational system. What happens to the African-American boy who is curious, who is asking questions, who maybe the work is not challenging enough for him, and he decides that he is going to do something else during that time? Look out the window, perhaps. He's immediately labeled as having ADHD or being a problem child. 
And when does that happen? Fundamental years, okay? So he's not gonna be the child that is gonna be recommended for the gifted program so that he can get in the channels that he needs in order for him to meet the level of success that he should meet for his level of intelligence. And that's happening all the time. I have experienced that with my own child. And that was when he was in preschool. And so, you know, it's everywhere. It is every segment of the population. So real estate, education, and then let's talk about the house of medicine. The house of medicine has not been kind to African-Americans. It really hasn't. The house of medicine has taken advantage of people, an entire group of people. I mean, we don't have to look very far to find examples of this. If you know anything about Dr. Sims, Dr. Sims utilized African-American women without any anesthesia whatsoever because he had a fundamental belief that women who have melanin in their skin, people who have melanin in their skin do not feel pain because they're not human. They don't feel pain. And so he would do operations, cutting into people's genital areas, operations without any anesthesia. And he developed all these things. He developed all these techniques. He developed all of these operations to, you know, aid his, his people, you know, his Caucasian patients by uh, experimenting on African-American slaves. Young women, 14, 15, 16, 17, completely disfiguring them in the name of science because they aren't human is the mentality. And they don't feel pain, so they don't need anesthetic like his people would need. So he gets, what does he get in return? He gets a uh, instrument named after him. He gets techniques named after him. He has, I mean, every single time I go to the OBGYN and they utilize a speculum, I'm reminded of that. I'm like, this is the same speculum that was devised by this man who did horrific things to young women because he thought they weren't human and they had no concept of pain or they couldn't feel pain. He gets, uh, he, so he gets all this notoriety. He gets a medical school named after him. He has statues put up, up for him. But what happened to those women? What happened to them? They suffered. They suffered and no, no apology, no nothing, nothing. Then you have the Tuskegee experiment. You have 600 men participating in this experiment. What was their reward? Their reward is, oh, you'll get, free medical exams and um, for your life. You get free medical exams for your life. What were they not told? They weren't told that they were in an experiment in actually to see what the natural progression of syphilis is. They weren't told that. And this experiment went on for 40 years, started in 1932 and went on for four zero years. So we all know that penicillin, which is the cure for this disease, was out well before the termination of the experiment. But what happened? This experiment continued. Medical students rotated through the ward where these gentlemen were treated, quote unquote which was no treatment because it was placebo, right? Because they weren't getting the cure. They were basically treated like animals. And again, what was the justification for that? What justification was there for you to continue an experiment on a group of people? And it's not just them, right? Because syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease. So what, they have partners, they have children. And so you are now not only affecting the lives of these people, but you are affecting the lives of all the people that they are in contact with. 40 years. So how can, how can people of color really trust medicine? How can they? I mean, look at the history. And even more recently, we have the famous 
cell line that has changed the world of cancer research and beyond. Famous cell line. What is it called? HeLa cells. And who did it come from? I bet most people don't even know. Most people don't even realize that the person who these cells originated from never gave consent for her cells to be even taken out of her body and tested. And her name is Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks had the misfortune of being a victim of cervical cancer. She sought her treatment at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And this is in 1951. And part of the treatment, she had a surgery where the surgeon removed pieces of her cervix, did not tell her, sent it to the lab. And basically what happened was up until that time, researchers were having a lot of difficulty with getting cells, human cells that would grow. They were having a rough time. But what they noticed was Henrietta cells basically brought success. They were able to get the cells to grow and it just, they just thrived. And then everybody started using the cells. I mean, it has been, it basically, I would say that the the countless breakthroughs in understanding and treatment of disease that came from her cells essentially spawned a multi-billion dollar industry. And she, she never gave permission. And, you know, this is her legacy. So why would people be upset when they come, when they come to the medical establishment? These are just some of the reasons. And I haven't even cited all of the situations. So when you look at a situation where that gentleman put his knee so cavalierly and put his body weight of pressure on another gentleman's neck for eight plus eight minutes and some seconds, that is a demonstration of decades of interwoven institutional racism that has been in this country. And it is mind boggling that worse has not happened yet as far as resistance to this. You know, you'd think that the civil rights movement would have meant the end of this, but it doesn't, it hasn't. You know, you would think that it would be clear that there is, you cannot, you cannot alienate 15% of your population. You just can't. Like it is, it is not wise. You think that we would learn from countries like South Africa, you know, when they dealt with the atrocities that apartheid meant and brought about. And then they had, they literally had a conversation, a public conversation about it in order to move forward. We've never had a public conversation about this. We've never had a public conversation about the empowerment that individuals within our society feel that because of how they look, they can just wield that power on other individuals without any cause. I mean, look at Amy Cooper. She literally thought that it was okay to pick up her phone and call the police and say the words, there's an African-American man that I feel threatened by. I mean, that is a sim a signal that something is very wrong. If we ignore that, then I don't know. Like I said, your head is buried deep in the sand because she knew what she was doing. She calmly did that. She knew that she could be ending his life by making that phone call. She knew the power that she held in her hand. You know, so when I, when I, when colleagues ask me, so, you know, well, what, what do I do? How do I make a difference? I say that if you truly want to be an ally, the first thing that you really need to do is recognize that there is a big problem and recognize that if you're silent about it, you're basically condoning it. 
That's the bottom line. And so you cannot let fear of what will happen stop you from saying something. And saying something could be actually saying something when you see something egregious happening, standing up for what is right and not letting it happen. I mean, the three individuals that stood around while this gentleman had his knee on this other gentleman's neck for that duration of time, that silence is is essentially complicit violence towards him directly. And the same is true. If you see something happening in your world and you know that it is not right, if you say nothing, then you're essentially agreeing with that concept. Now, maybe you don't feel comfortable right now, which I, I get. Dealing with truth is not comfortable. Dealing with your fear, deep down fear, that's just not comfortable. And so I get that. But don't let that discomfort stop you from standing up for what is right. And just realize that if a portion of the population is oppressed, guess what? It's going to affect everything, everyone. It will eventually affect us all. So don't think that you could just kind of like go off in the corner and hide and ignore it or shut it off because it's not going anywhere. It hasn't gone anywhere for decades. It's been here. This man is not the first to be killed untimely for what he looked like regardless of anything else he's done. He's not the first. I hope that he is the last, but I strongly doubt it because like I said, it's just so entrenched in this society. The other thing that you can do, so like I said, speak up if you see injustice. The other thing that you can do is you can listen. You can listen to what people are saying. Listen to what you're your friends or your family or whomever you come in contact with, your patients, if you're a physician, please, please listen to them. We are trained as physicians to be good listeners. And we ask questions that are open questions so that we can get more data so we can be even better listeners. This situation is no different. Now, that's not to say that you need to go and reach out to every person that you know that has melanin and say, so what's the problem? You know, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that listen when they, when they're willing to speak about what's happening to them or they're offering options for assisting in the movement, or they're offering options where you can go forego being silent. That's what I mean. Learning about who they are because African Americans are not a monolith, okay? It's not just one type of person. It only thing we have in common, to be honest, like we all have in common is that there's melanin in our skin. That's the one thing. <laughs> but we do so we are so different like every other group of people. You're going to have so many different things. And so in that vein, I can tell you that you can find a commonality between you. You can find shared value between you. And when you have shared value, because we all kind of want the same things, right? No matter where we are in the world, we want the same things. We want to have, you know, a family that we love or people that we love. We want to be able to give back to society in a positive way. And, you know, we just want to be able to enjoy life. That's a basic basic things that are pretty much everybody shares, no matter what language you speak, no matter where you live, no matter what you look like. So there are common things that we share, despite the fact that we look differently. So, you know, look for that common ground. Um, and then support the effort. If you can't speak out, you can also support the effort by writing your congressperson, voting, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, simple things, civic duties, voting, making sure that there aren't, you know, donate to organizations that are making sure that there is not redrawing of district lines to alter the ability of different groups to be able to vote. You know, these are things. Support 
organizations like the NAACP support organizations like Color Color for Change, Color of Change, um, Hope in the City. There's so many great organizations that are doing the work to help us to do and ask the hard questions so that we can step forward and actually be cohesive as a nation and actually live up to the ideals of the country, right? Have the ability to have the American dream. So I had a lot I had to get off my chest, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. The one last thing that I did want to share is uh, I listened to a very insightful broadcast by Dr. Delisha. She she got, she basically was having a, sim, a similar experience where she was kind of being asked to represent the entire black entire black population, which I think is always interesting, <laughs> but happens a lot when you are one of you know very few or you are the only one. And so you know it's it's okay if if um if people are curious, right? I get that. Just don't touch my hair and don't say, how does my hair do that? Because that annoys me to the nth degree. So, you know, she gave some steps forward and some pot potential ways in which you can start the dialogue, right? Start the dialogue and really be an ally and by having the discussion. And the first thing that she says is really uh, recognizing what it is, right? Recognize it for what it is. It is an ugly beast. It's called racism. And it it rears its ugly head in many different ways, subtle, overt. It doesn't matter. It's still there. It's existing. You got to acknowledge it. Right. And then the next thing she says, you know, kind of don't approach the situation as a, a means for which you are to be educated by that person. So I don't go up to my Indian friends and say, oh my God, can you tell me all about what it's like to be Indian? Oh my goodness. India is a flipping huge country with a billion people in it with all kinds of different religions it has you know different sex it has different um types of food if you're in southern india or northern india people look different depending on where you are in india if you're up at the top in the mountains you look asian <laughs> so i mean it just doesn't make sense to do that right because the same thing is true for people of color you know i could be black and be born in amsterdam I could be black and be born in Liberia. I could be black and be born in Germany. Like I'm black, but I may have a very different background. So you can't expect that we are going to educate you. You just can't because that is exhausting. Number one for us, because if every single time I'm expected to be the person that is going to represent millions of people, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, just think about that. Um, but I would say that the approach shouldn't be educate me, but the approach may be something like, this is what I've read, you know, because you've gone and you actually like looked something up that you were going to ask. You, you kind of looked it up and you said, is this true or is this true for you? Is this true for you? Because it could be true for someone else and not true for you, the person that you're talking to. And they're both black. So, you know, don't be a lazy student is what she says. She says, you know, you go and do some, some legwork on your own before you, before you come and talk to your friend who happens to have melanin in their skin. Then number three, she says, resist telling people how to feel, you know, why are you so angry? Why are you angry? Why are you, why are you always angry? Don't tell people how to feel. It's just not, it's not a good look, number one. And it also, it doesn't bring you to a place where you can actually have a meaningful conversation because it immediately triggers a blocker on the recipient's part. So I would never, ever tell, and, and it's, it's natural. I mean, I don't want you to think that it's, it's, it's a crazy thought. It's a natural thing for us to be like, oh yeah, you know, I kind of know how you feel because the other day I stubbed my toe and oh my goodness, my, tub, my toe hurts. So, and, and I was kind of upset about that. That doesn't equate to 
being judged every single day of your life and having low expectations of you. And, oh, you're so articulate. How could you be so articulate? How did you learn to speak so well? Oh my gosh, that is like microaggression 101. Why would I not be articulate? Why do you think that black people don't know how to speak? <laughs> Just, yeah, you could tell that one uh, presses a button for me. And then number four is resist saying, you know, like that you identify with how they feel. And I just gave you an example of that. Number five is listen more and talk less. So my mom says this, a lot of moms say this, but we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. We need to listen. And, and that's true for everybody, right? We all need to listen and absorb, digest, you know, um, and then be able to talk. And in a more intelligent way, of course, because now we have gathered the data by listening and we know where the other party is coming from. And then number six, she mentions is um, to, to speak with respect. Now, if I don't know something or, you know, if, they, if I have a friend or I know someone who is of a different culture and I have a question about it, you know, I'm not going to approach them in a disrespectful manner because I know that when you do that, that's when you get the rebuff and you get the, you know, the defensive response. So just keep in mind, you know, if you have a humble attitude and you're genuinely wanting to learn or know something that goes a long way. So, you know, we respect each other when we're having a conversation, it makes for a better conversation. So the same is true when it comes to dealing with issues like this, right? This is a hot topic. People are not comfortable talking about it. And there's a reason why they're not comfortable talking about it because it's real. <laughs> and, you know, you know, there's just, uh, there's just so much to unpack there. Thank you, Dr. Peebles. I saw she said that she she liked the points. And then the last one is, and, and, and so when we have respect, mutual respect, we have authentic relationships and we can actually have conversations that are going to lead to change. And that is really what is going to make all the difference. And then the last one, you know, looking for shared values. So I mentioned this already, but we all have things in common. You know, I know people who literally love city planning. I have one in my house, my son. He loves to do city planning. He loves to, you know, learn about the intricacies of putting a city together and all of the things that you need to have in place for the structure of a city, the highways, what kind of highways, what do the, what do the overpasses look like? What do the on-ramps look like? What do the off-ramps look like? That is something that he shares with a select few of group of people. And that's a common ground between them. Now, it doesn't matter that they don't all look like him. Why? Doesn't matter because they have that shared value. They love city skylines or urban planning or whatever it is that they love. You know, so there's always something that we share. I told you that the three basic things that we all share is we all want to, you know, we all just want to have like a home or something like that, some semblance of a home, which may include a family. And we want to have a good life and we want to give back in some way to our society. Like that's basic. Like that's, th those are three potential things that we all share. And so you can definitely find shared values. And that is a great basis on which you can have authentic exchanges. And that is a great basis on which you can have authentic conversations. And it is by having conversations, by not staying silent, when we see this type of thing manifesting implicitly or explicitly, like what happened to George Floyd, and doing our part to effecting change. Because if we don't, if we let fear hold us back and we do not do anything, then we're just basically signing the check for the destruction of our world as we know it. And that sounds a little bit morbid, 
but it's really true. So I told you guys that this was a very different episode. And like I said, it's, it's broadcasting live on the Facebook page. I'm going to put it on YouTube once it's all said and done. I'll be uploading the episode to Lipson tomorrow so you can listen to it at your leisure. Unpack it, discuss it, send me comments. I'd love to hear because I, I definitely want to hear what your thoughts are on it. And I really, really hope that we can move forward in a positive direction and that we can really see a better world for our children because, man, we can't continue like this. We just can't. All right. So that's what I have for you today. Uh, I hope that you have an amazing week. And like I said, hit me up because I am very interested in your comments. Okay. Take care.